are back for another podcast episode. We are filming live on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, apps, and actually. And on Friday mornings, I take this live episode, I upload it into um, all of the major podcast platforms so that you can listen at any time that you like at your leisure, okay? So I'm gonna turn off this meditation music that I have next to me. <laughs> um, it kind of helps me slow down with my uh, speech as I'm recording these podcasts. However, today it, it just feels a little distracting. So I am going to just simply turn it off. So give me just a moment. All right. Okay, so we're in the second season, second series of the Music Meets the Boardroom podcast, okay? And I had no intention of the second series being as long as it's going to be. <laughs> but there's so much that needs to be shared. And I just don't want to end this series without sharing this valuable information with you. So today, and a few podcasts forward as well, we're going to be talking about steps, important steps to take before you release music. I know many of you who are listening have downloaded the free checklist, which is in the description section that is called 25 steps to take before you release your music single. And I'm sure many of you have questions about some of those steps. So over the next few podcasts, we're going to be breaking down some of those important steps that are listed so that they're clear and you know exactly what you need to do every single time you release music. Here's the deal. You're not just releasing music to share just to share music unless you just want to do that. That's your right. At the same time, if you are someone who really wants to grow um, your music and the opportunity that comes with releasing music and take advantage of that, why not release your music the best way you possibly can? And here's another thing that I find very interesting. Oftentimes, artists or someone you may know may say, well, I just want to get the music out and just share it and let people enjoy it. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that. However, when something happens with your music in a way that you could benefit from, and it's very obvious of that, then we look back and we say, man, I wish I would have taken proper steps to protect that art because at this point it's gone viral and there's nothing I can do about it. So we're going to talk about some steps you can take right now today um, to help protect the beautiful art and gift that you're working with. OK, um, if you would like to follow along with these steps as we go through them, you're welcome to download that free checklist that's in the description. And uh, we're going to be just walking through those steps. Hello. All right, here we go. Let's start with the beginning. The very first one, collect documents, collect important documents. OK, music can be. How can I say this? Um, when you're creating art and emotions are involved and it's very personal to people and money is involved, it's important to have documents that document who owns what and why, who has the right to do what with that music so that everyone is clear. Everyone involved is, in clear, is clear about their role, their responsibility and what they contribute to that creation. So you're going to start with a split sheet, okay? Also, if you download that 25 steps freebie, you're going to receive a free split sheet as well. So those of you who are watching, I'm going to show you really quick in the camera what it looks like. Okay. And I'm going to do a future episode just talking about split sheets in how to fill it out properly and why, and we're gonna talk about why you need it today, but in the future, I'm going to um, go through each line and talk about what needs to be filled in where, but right now let's get to the meat of why this is important. Split sheet. A split sheet is used to document the percentage of ownership of a music uh, piece of work, 
right? A track, a, a single, a song. And on that split sheet, everyone who is going to receive royalties from that creation needs to be part of the split sheet documentation process. And you'll be able to list the percentage in which they own. They'll be able to sign off on it, provide their um, information so that you can track that properly in future steps. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. And everyone involved in the creation, uh, who involved in the split sheet process, who's part of that, needs to receive a copy of that split sheet. They need that for their record. There are other important reasons why you need a split sheet, not just for directly with the people that are working with the project, but when you get to the distribution process, you're going to need to indicate who owns what in regards to that work of art. And if a split sheet conversation has not taken place, you don't know. And then you have to go back to those involved and start asking those questions. And that can get messy because you may have one person who says, well, I want 100% of the project, even though they may not even financially contribute to the project. Or you may have someone that you agreed with to give, you know, 20%. I'm just giving out some numbers. And you get to the distribution process and they say, well, I changed my mind. I want 60% of the project. Well, if you have no documentation, what do you do? You're in a mess, right? You can have fallout, you can have problems and things of that nature. So have a conversation about split sheets before you even get into the studio. Before you start to collaborate, have a conversation about split sheets. Also, I have, it has been shared with me over the past few years of situations where artists have brought up the conversation of split sheets and people have gotten mad about it. Why are you asking me about a split sheet? Do you not trust me? Um, this is supposed to be a fun process. Why are you making this complicated because you're asking for a split sheet? Let me share something with you very valuable. If you are working and collaborating with someone who gets upset about a split sheet, you may need to reevaluate that long life commitment of making a piece of work that's going to live forever with that person. Not because they're a bad person, but because they're simply not in the same headspace that you are in. They're not, not yet in the direction, not moving in the same direction that you're moving in. So you can do one of two, you can do one of several things. You can just say, you know what, forget it. I'm going to move forward with this. That's your right. Or you can take the time to explain to them why this is important and how it actually benefits them as well. Or you can decide to, you know, go work with another artist who cherishes the value of their work as much as you do. You have that choice. You have that right. You just have to determine how you plan to move forward. Never feel ashamed or embarrassed for wanting to protect your gift, your art, and your investment. Never feel guilty for that. Okay, I'm off my soapbox, so we're going to move on, okay? <laughs> and I'll do a more extensive uh, podcast and video in regards to split sheets, so to make sure that's super, super clear. NDAs. NDAs are also a valuable document you want to have on hand. Get a copy of an NDA that um, is updated and covers everything that you need for your business and use it. If you have a project, whether it's a video, um, music, anything of that nature, and you want to keep that experience as confidential as possible, have everyone involved sign NDAs. Professional people have signed NDAs before. They're not going to be insulted. 
that you ask them for an NDA. You want to work with professional people. You are professional. And professional people understand and respect the process. Let me give you an example as a musician, an artist, how NDAs can benefit you and cover your backside, okay? Let's say, for example, you have a band and you've hired some musicians to collaborate with and you've come up with a really unique sound and you're like, man, this is going to be great. People are going to love this unique sound. And those musicians were part of that process. And you go out and you start performing that music out in the community. And people are loving it, right? And you have maybe some fellow artists that come through the come through and say, "Man, I really love that unique sound." Let me let me hire some of these musicians, which they have the right to do because musicians work with many different artists. Now let's say they get into rehearsal and someone references that beautiful unique sound that you came up with and says, oh, how did you get that kind of like sound? What was that unique technique that you did? And guess what? Of course, friendly conversation. They're going to start talking about it. Next thing you know, you're not the only band or artist that's generating that unique sound anymore. But if everyone involved in your projects and your band know that what happens in rehearsals stays in rehearsals, then you can protect that unique sound a little bit more, right? I'm sure someone could kind of listen to a sound and come and figure out the technique, but you know what? Maybe just slow down the process a little bit, right? Don't just hand it over to, to someone willingly when you've we've spent so much time coming up with that and um, investing energy and resources and, and being the unique artist that you are. Moving on, work for hire agreements. Work for hire agreements are used when you are hiring someone at a flat rate to do a particular type of job. Um, a work for hire is more for situations where someone is not getting royalties from something. They're just providing a service at a flat rate. And this can happen uh, maybe you hire a musician for um, a gig, you know, even if you hire a musician for a gig or um, to come into the studio and to lay drums and they say, you know what, I really don't care about all this stuff. I just literally just want to get paid right now. So I'm going to pay my rent. <laughs> and you're like, okay. And so you work out that agreement, but you want to make sure that that is on paper so that, you know, they don't come back later and say, hey, you know, I want more money. You say, nope, you 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 signed this um, work for hire agreement. This is this was the mutual understanding here. A collaborative agreement is so important. Oh my gosh, I made this mistake. I made this mistake, everybody. So let me share with you why this is important. When you are collaborating with other artists on a song, you need a collaborative agreement. Every person who is involved in the creative process and is part ownership, has part ownership of that song or album needs to be part of the collaborative agreement process. A collaborative agreement is going to define who owns what and who can do what with that song. When this is not discussed and agreed upon before the song is released, it can get ugly. And it even can stop some of the things that you can do with that song because one person can say, well, I don't want the song in commercials. And the other person can say, I want the song in commercials. And then you may have another person who says, I don't want you to promote the song at all. And now you've got a problem because everyone is not on the same page. And you want to make sure everyone is on the same page before that song is released. Okay, so let me go through this section one more time. So we've got 
collect your documents, which include your split sheets, your NDAs, your work for hire, your collaborative agreements, and anything else that you think might be important. That that's going to be more of your, these are going to be more of your higher priority components. Moving on to two. I'm only going to share five today because it's, it's, it's a lot, right? And I want you to be able to take this information today and go put it into practice today. Go put it into practice today, tomorrow at the latest. So I don't want to give you so much to where it's overwhelming and nothing gets done. So I'm going to give you five things to go out and do. Next week, we'll go through five more. The second one here is your mixing and mastering. This sounds so simple. Some of us, we get this, right? We understand how important it is not to skip the mixing and mastering process. But here's the deal. Oftentimes, we get really excited about a project. And we're like, oh, I can skip this part or I can skip that part or maybe I'll mix it and then I won't master it. Or maybe I just won't really spend a lot of time on the mixing and I'll just go ahead and go to the mastering process. No, don't do it. Take the time to put the love in your project fully from beginning to end the best way you can where you are. Mix your process, your project. Hire a professional person to mix your process, your project. If you're great at mixing and you have that talent, so be it. Keep in mind, it is valuable to have different sets of ears listening at different phases of your project because different people will be able to catch the mistakes that you will not be able to catch. When you are listening to music for hours at a time, everything starts to sound great. You listen to something for three hours, it sounds great. You walk away from it for about a week and you come back to it, you're like, oh my gosh, I hear this and that. I need to fix all of this stuff. You'll start to hear things. And so that's why it's great to bring other people, other ears into your project. So you're going to hire someone professionally to mix your process. You're going to hire someone professionally to master your pro- your project. We want to be professional right out the gate. And it is a inexpensive process to do both professionally. Another reason why it's so important to master your project is you want your sound to be consistent across all musical devices, whether it's in a car, whether it's playing inside your home or so be it. We want it to, we want the sounds to show up richly no matter who is playing your song. Also, mastering, you have to master your song to to get radio play. Radio will not play your music if it's not a professional recording. And If you're investing money and time into your music, then I would assume that you would want all the possibilities for people to hear your art. So don't skip the mixing and mastering process. It's required for professional level opportunity. It's required for professional level opportunity. Okay. All right. So I am going to take a break right now and recognize our sponsor, the hybrid executive.com. And I will be back right in a moment. See you soon. Hold on just a moment. Learn about the ever-changing climate of the music industry and learn how to position yourself with the new book, Hybrid Executive, great for indiepreneurs, indie artists, managers, engineers, booking agents, and more. Hybrid Executive is the new terminology for today's indie artist, written by music producer Samuel E. Archer. Now available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, Book Baby, and other leading ebook distributors. Visit thehybridexecutive.com for more information. 
And we're back, everyone. We are back. I love the hybridexecutive.com. Go over there and check them out. They're doing such great things for artists and they're so passionate about your success. So go over, connect with them, download their book. And also, if you are interested in advertising with us or sponsoring an episode, reach out to contact at musicmeetstheboardroom.com and we will get in touch with you within 24 hours with updates on how to be a part of our episodes moving forward. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. All right, so let's talk about our third important component, metadata, metadata, metadata. No one talks about this, but it's important. Okay. So metadata is the information that is attached to your music, to your single, to your album. It is attached on the back end of your song. The reason why you have metadata is so radios and streaming companies and those that have to track sales can track sales and they are able to indicate who owns what music and who is owed what, right? Who is owed what type of money, right? And how to track you down in a, in, in, in a way, right? For them, it's a way, it's, it's metadata is used for many different things, right? It's, it's used to track sales. It's used to track who owns, um, who, what, who is tied to what music. And it's also used for, um, probably for like studies and things like that as well, when it comes to music releases and things like, you know, and let me share with you why this is important to you. Okay. It's important to you because metadata is required for radio play is required for um, distribution. Right. Once again, it goes back to the opportunity and your money. Now, when you're releasing when you're releasing music and you're using a distribution company, there's different requirements for for different distribution companies. So, the best advice that I can give is to reach out directly to your distribution channel company and find out what their requirement is in terms of when they want you to add your metadata. Some companies don't want you to add it directly to the music, to the back end of the track during the the mastering process. They want you to manually upload or they're gonna, going to assign some of that information onto your track once you've uploaded your music into, into the distribution channel. There are others that want you to put it on there before you upload it into the distribution channel. So work with your, the first thing I would do is share with the person who's mastering your music what distribution channel you're going to be using. A professional person who masters music for a living is going to know, more likely going to know the answer to to the question. Do we put the metadata on there first or do we wait till distribution? And then also, like I said, reach out to your distribution and get that clear. Okay, that's really important. You need to have metadata for radio play. Let me also mention this too. So. Let's say, for example, you use a distribution company that says, don't put any metadata on your track. We're going to do that for you during the distribution process. Okay, no problem. You've given them your music. You have given them all your data for them to create that for you. However, let's say you want to save a copy for yourself and you want to use it to send out to people and to radio stations and things like that. That particular copy needs to have your metadata on it. So have whoever is mastering your project add it to the back end of that file. Okay. So you've got two steps there. Okay. That's important. So I've got some notes in front of me. So I'm going to be looking down a little bit for those that are tuning in to make sure I don't miss anything that might be important to you. So as I mentioned, add to add your metadata either at the mastering phase or the distribution phase process. You have to do research to make sure it what process is best for you. And it's required for radio play for regulations and for them to be able to tie back how to pay you, okay? And document that. So, let's talk about pro. 
PRO, Performance Rights Organizations. Let me be quite honest about this here. I think pros can do a better job at explaining with what they actually do. Um, and I think that will come with time, you know, but we're going to just share today a little bit about what a performance rights organization does and why it's important for you to sign up for a multitude of reasons. Okay. So once again, a pro. So you might hear someone say, Hey, are you part of a pro? What pro are you part of? If you are releasing music, you should be part of a pro. That really shouldn't even be an option. If if you're releasing music heavily and you're not part of a pro, I'm concerned. <laughs> I'm concerned. And I'm going to share with you why. Um, if you're using a distribution channel, platform, company, they are going to require it. They're going to ask you, what pro are you with? And if you're not with one, you'll have to go sign up with one. So there are Three primary top pros. There are lots of other ones too, but there's three that are primary. And that is ASCAP, BMI, and SESAC, which isn't used very often. I don't hear people talk about that one as much. I hear people talk more about ASCAP and BMI. But I'm gonna like I'm gonna spell the third one so you can go look it up and do some research. It's S-E-S-A-E. Okay. So you want to sign up with the pro one, you're going to need it for distribution, as I mentioned. And when you go sign up for a pro, make sure you're signed up as a artist. If you are solely an artist, if you are solely a songwriter, sign up as a songwriter. But if you're an artist and a songwriter, you need to sign up for both options. Do not leave an option out. One other thing that I'm going to talk about later, but I'm going to mention it now because you're going to need it for the back end of your pro. I believe if I remember correctly, because it's been a while since I've had to sign up for one, but I believe there's a, a, a phase where they ask for the social security number of all of the songwriters, I believe, and you can sign up for an EIN instead of sharing your social security number out with people. Sign up for an EIN. You can do that on the IRS website. You can use that freely. You don't have to worry about that, you know, getting stolen your identity. And when you're writing a lot of music and collaborating with people and getting writing credit, you want to protect your social security number. So sign up for an EIN. It literally takes 15 minutes to do and you'll get it on the same day that you sign up. Okay. Now, when you select a pro organization, what I would recommend is to do the research and find out which one is best for you. Because there are some pros that charge a fee to sign up and there's some pros that don't. Like ASCAP charges a fee, BMI does not. And also the way that they collect royalties is slightly different. So you have to look at that and figure out what works best for you. OK, so what they primarily do is they license, collect, distribute public performance royalties in areas such as TV, movies, film, radio, restaurants, bars and things like that. So they really make sure that these type of elements and areas are compliant and not taking advantage of your art. Right not playing your music over and over and not giving credit or payment where due. And if you've ever been to a, a performance uh, center or a bar or restaurant where they have bands and they want you to primarily pay, play your original music, they don't want you really playing covers. It's because they don't want a pro coming after them finding them for playing covers of other performers. And then you also have bars and restaurants that pay the fee annually, traditionally, and you can play whatever you want. Okay. 
If you have any questions, leave the questions in the comments. I would love to answer your questions. Love to answer your questions. Leave those questions. I want to hear from you. Okay. All right. We're going to keep going. And there's one more I want to share with you. And we are going to conclude out so you can go and execute all of this. And then we'll be back next Thursday talking about more important components and steps. So the fifth is copywriting your music. Copyright your music. I don't care what anybody has to say. You'll hear people say, oh, you release your music and Therefore, you are, that's your copyright, right? You have, you're protected. That is right to a certain extent. You want full protection of the law. You really, really do. You want full protection of law. In order to get full protection of the law, you have to formally copyright your music. Don't get lazy and not do this. Don't get worried about the money and not do this. It's only like 55 bucks or 60 bucks or whatever to copyright a project. Do it. Invest. Do it. Remember, this copyright can be passed on to generations to come. You never know what's going to become of your music. And you want to be able to make sure that those that follow you can benefit from your hard work. Your copyright really is your masters. Who owns this project? And if you got your your master kind of just like blowing in the wind and anybody can come and steal it away from you, what sense does that make? So copyright your music. If you're not sure where exactly where to go, two things. One, you can download the checklist that I have in the bio, um, in the description section. And I believe I have it linked in that checklist. Also, you can just Google copyright. How do I copyright? Where do I go to copyright? And the website will pop up for you. The website looks a little intimidating, but it's not. Just go out on Google and figure out how to do that process. Go to YouTube, Watch more than one video, though, and make sure that the process that they're showing you is consistent and do it. You probably can do it by just reading the the questions alone. What I would recommend doing, though, is logging into the system, looking at each question and looking up how to properly fill out each question as you're going along so you can do it correctly. Or you can hire an attorney or someone to help you do it. You don't have to have an attorney to do that to copyright your music. You don't have to, but if you prefer to work with an attorney, do it. What are the type of things that you would copyright? When it comes to your music, it would be your lyrics and your music. Your lyrics and the music of your song. You can copyright other things like photos. If you have a photo that you're gonna use that you know is going to be a high profile photo, copyright it. Celebrities do it all the time. Celebrities copyright their photos all the time because they want to control, maybe there's a particular photo that they don't want all over the place and they want to be able to generate revenue off of that photo. Um, especially when people like sell, sell pictures and things like that. Like, you know, this picture is worth X amount of money. Um, that a celebrity has taken, they are copywriting that so they can control who has the rights to that work. Um, A manuscript, if you are writing a play, if you are writing a book, copyright it, copyright that work. They, They, like I said, people tell you not to do it. Don't worry about it. No, do it. All right, so your copyrights can be part of your will and you will need your split sheet to complete your copyright process if you are collaborating with people who are part ownership, who are in, if you have the conversation of copyright ownership agreement there where you're splitting up some things. 
You'll need that. You need to define that in your split sheet and have that conversation before this process. It does take about a year to get your documentation in the mail. But when you get your documentation in the mail, it's a beautiful thing. It feels so great to have something legit from the government saying we acknowledge that you own this work. It feels really good. Don't skip the process. Okay. That's what I got about that. I don't, I'm trying to make sure I'm not skipping anything else that might be important about copywriting, but make it a part of your normal process. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude so that you can implement all of these steps. So really quickly, let me just reinstate one, collect all important documentation. Don't skip that mixing and mastering process. Make sure your metadata is added to your project at the right time. Join a pro organization and join the one that's right for you. Copyright all of your work. Do not skip that process. In conclusion today, I want to say that releasing music is not an easy process at first, but once you get used to it, these steps become easier and not as overwhelming. And having a checklist or documenting your process is going to help the next time become a lot easier. Take the time to do that. You're worth it. Okay, superstar. All right, we will be back here next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Central Time with our live recording. And then we upload the episode at 5 a.m. every single Friday um, for those who are listening in other parts of the world and other countries. And we will be back with five more powerful tips to help your music be successful. Love you, superstar. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah.